Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Ringing the bell before a talk makes it sound momentous, but actually I just like ringing the bell. Um, we got it on the opening day of this retreat hall. We were thinking we needed a bell and then magically Zen Center sent us, San Francisco Zen Center sent us a gift, said, we think you need a bell, and we did. So thank you from Zen Center. So you've completed one day of the retreat practice, and a few of you are on your first retreat. Many of you have done quite a few retreats, and it still is a process of settling down. Um, Tonight I'd like to talk about the core of our practice together. I'd like to talk about mindfulness, or what I also will be using as a synonym, loving awareness. And if you read in the Buddhist texts, they begin, there's the most wonderful way for living beings to realize uh, well-being and liberation and overcome sorrow and grief and lamentation and despair. I think that uh, Spring talked about that. And it's the, the practice of mindfulness. And in other texts it says mindfulness is all helpful. Or mindfulness is the gateway to liberation and freedom. And so I want us to think together, those of you who've been practicing for a long time, those who are newer, about this, what, what this means and what it means for us. How does this operate? There are two ways to function in the world. One is without mindfulness. This is sometimes called the samsaric or cyclic or cyclic, uh, the, way, the cyclic way of living. Because without mindfulness, without some sense of awareness, when experiences arise, what arises with them is habit, reactivity. We get fearful, we get caught, we're blind, we like it, we don't like it. And without mindfulness, we live in a kind of um, somewhat unconscious set of patterns um, that simply enact the conditioning around us, the cultural conditioning, the educational conditioning and so forth. Um, and as we do, not only is there not much sense of awareness and freedom, but unfortunately those build because they're based in its delusion um, on fear, on a sense that we can't trust the world, that we have to protect ourselves. It's called the body of fear. And it grows. And just coming back from teaching with Trudy in China, being in Asia, talking to people in Singapore and Korea and so forth, um, as those societies have modernized, there's a tremendous amount of stress. There's all the kind of great prosperity that's happened, but there's also extremely high suicide rates for their children in Korea and Singapore and parts of China who are being driven to be ambitious and kind of fulfill the goals of their parents or of the society. And then there's the grief that comes in the struggle. All of this is a kind of samsaric way of being where things continue to operate, but there's not a sense of inner freedom, of mindfulness, of being able to step back and really listen in a wise way. And then if you read what is called the fire sermon, one of the first major talks of the Buddha, um, he begins, this world is burning. This world is on fire, which is something that I think you can taste in the air here. So it's not just metaphorical, but then he goes on with, in what way, what way is this world burning? It's burning with the fires of greed, 
It's burning with the fires of hatred and ignorance. It's burning with the fires of delusion. Um, and these fires cause immense suffering. And we can see those forces as they operate in the world and to a certain extent in our own lives when we're caught in greed and grasping and hatred and fear and ignorance and confusion. Um, that's the samsaric nature, the repetitive nature of unconsciousness. After his enlightenment, as the myth tells it, the Buddha surveyed the world with the eye of compassion, all four quarters of the world, and saw that there were beings suffering everywhere in different ways from delusion and greed and fear. And, and he saw that it would be possible to teach them a way that brought inner peace, liberation, wakefulness, ease, a sense of trust, graciousness. And the way that he taught was to offer what we're doing here, the training and practice of mindfulness. Now, whether you're a long-term practitioner or whether you're somewhat new, you don't have to wait for more years to find freedom and you don't have to go to a long retreat in Thailand or Burma or go to the Himalayas. Freedom and well-being is available exactly where you are. I mean, where else would it be? This very body and this very mind is the place of liberation. It's the place we can get entangled and lost and habitual and repetitive and reactive and fearful. And it's also the place where trust, graciousness, wakefulness, compassion also can be born. And as we find these, or as we mature into them over the years of practice for many of you, we also then bring these qualities to the world that so much needs them. And you're all familiar with the passage from Thich Nhat Hanh where he says, when the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person on the boat remain centered and calm, it was enough. It showed the way for everyone to survive. And so as you train and practice in this great art of mindfulness and loving awareness, you become that person on the boat of the world that so much needs it. The invitation, however many years of practice that you have um, done, is, has two sides to it. One side, which uh, Spring spoke about this morning, is an invitation to ease. This is from Zen Master Ryokan, the most beloved poet in Japan, of Japanese history. He writes, if someone asks, what is the mark of enlightenment or illusion? I cannot say, praise and blame Wealth and honor are nothing but dust. As the evening falls, I sit in my hermitage and stretch out both feet as an answer. And so there he is in his mountain hermitage, praise and blame, gain and loss, wealth and honor. What is the mark of enlightenment? I stretch out my feet in answer. There's something so gracious and lovely about. He's not in conflict with the world. So one of the invitations for your practice is to find ease in your heart, in your body, in your mind. And the other, which is a complement to that, is the invitation of fearlessness. And fearlessness doesn't mean you won't have fear. Someone, anybody in this room not have fear? Raise your hand. You can have your money back. You know, it doesn't work that way. Fearlessness is something else. It is the steadiness or courage and the discipline to be present for this world with graciousness and ease on one side, but also with your full being. And this is the invitation of practice, both ease 
and a kind of fearlessness that grows as we sit and walk. Also, you know, think about where we're going in the spiritual path. The goal is not so much to get somewhere, but rather to open to the mystery of life. As it said, the mystery of life is not a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. And I think about sitting with one of the teachers from Spirit Rock, Marlene Jones, a couple years ago, she had uh, heart failure And unfortunately, where she was and the circumstances, it took a long time for the paramedics to get to her, 15 or 20 minutes, so she had no oxygen to her brain for a long time. They got her to the hospital and iced her down and put put her in a coma and brought her back out. And for a week, tried everything they could to get any response from her. Nothing. They did all kinds of tests. Brain dead. Zero. Um... So, sitting with her family, um, together we decided, all right, it's time to take her off all the life support machines. And I was holding her hand and looking at her and saying, Marlene, you know, you've been so important and such a great colleague and, you know, you're dying too soon. I'm going to miss you and so many things you could have done with us and, you know, um, but the least you could do is give us a sign. Something like that, sort of teasing her a little bit and trying to make people who are sitting with her, her daughter and so forth, um, smile a little bit as well. And as soon as I said that, two tears rolled down her cheeks. A week, nothing. The doctors prodding her, the different electrical brain monitoring and so forth, nothing. The least you could do is give us a sign and the tears who are we? Who are you? What is that spirit that was born into your body and that will also leave your body when you die? I could tell lots more stories, but you get the idea of it, that we actually live in mystery. And to be a human being is the most remarkable, mysterious thing you can imagine. Now, I was at the first White House Buddhist leadership gathering a couple of years ago, I don't think that will be happening again soon. (laughs) I'm going to leave that aside. And was able to give one of the key talks there, which was on the Buddhist teachings of wise society, of treating all members of society with respect, coming together in harmony and and leaving in harmony. You know the things we've seen so recently. Um, uh, Taking care of the vulnerable, the young, the elderly, those who are sick, the women, that this is a way, said the Buddha, that a pros- society prospers and does not decline. Um, and care for the environment. There's a whole text about why society, but it's also not all that different than what you'd find in, a great, in, in the great spiritual t- traditions around the world from the Native Americans or from you know, the, 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 the wisest teachings in Jewish and Christian and, and um, native traditions in Africa and all kinds of places like that. But the difference um, and what made this conference so compelling was that while these are beautiful visions of why society, there's actually a way to do it. And so with the 5,000 studies of neuro and neuroscience papers and things in the last few decades on mindfulness and compassion, it's now, as you know, in school systems, tens of thousands of them, in clinics, in uh, um, being em- employed in other ways, in, you know, in business, in, art, uh, in arts and so forth. There is, I have a big uh, packet that was sent to me called Mindful Nation, signed by the 85 members of the British Parliament Mindfulness Group. We can only hope that it's transmitted across the pond to our side sometime soon. With mindfulness, it comes an invitation to freedom here and now where we are. It's the only place we can find it. And it manifests in three different levels. Call it mindfulness or loving awareness. The first level of freedom is our ability to know 
and be present for the content of experience. So we're sitting with our breath and our body and uh, we have tension and pain and pleasure and ease um, and tingling and heat and fire. Um, and we learn how to sit with it. We can name it gently. This is tingling, this is tension. These are the different experiences we have. But as we sit and the body starts to open, we become aware of the content of our body experience. These are all the sensations and feelings and so forth that, we, that make up our body. And what grows with this in neuroscience is called the win- window of tolerance. Because we live in a society that is pretty much terrified of pain. We live in a, cult- a culture of comfort. Too cold, turn up the heat. Too hot, turn on the air conditioning. You know, um, do whatever you can to make yourself comfortable. And if you're uncomfortable, the problem is out there. But here, um, first of all, anybody in the room not have discomfort or pain in their life in spite of all those attempts to keep it at bay. You don't have to bother raising your hand. right? So this is the way it is, praise and blame and pleasure and pain. We have it. And so if we can actually be with the content of our experience, we start to find a freedom already. Freedom with pain, freedom with tingling and tension and hot and cold. And instead of being as reactive, mindfulness allows us to be present for that experience. Um, And of course, it can get more extreme. Trudy and I had a dinner. We were in Hawaii visiting some friends. And this world-famous magician named David Blaine was at dinner doing some card tricks that just, I couldn't imagine how he did it. He said he loved doing them in front of, especially in front of scientists. He showed us some videos. He'd done it with Stephen Hawking's and Bill Gates. And they were kind of going crazy, like, how could you do that? What's the, what's the physics of this? I just said, this is really good magic, you know. But anyway, um, and he was talking about, because he also pushes his body. He's the guy who hung in a glass box over the Thames River for 43 days, only drinking things without eating. So he's a sort of, he's an extreme kind of guy. And I talked about living in a monastery where our training was to master the postures by sitting for 24 hours without moving or standing for 24 hours without moving. Um, And he said, oh yeah, I once did 12 days standing without moving. I said, okay, you got it, you know. (laughs) But it felt like there was some kind of brotherhood with him. He was really, it was... was Um, But what happens when we learn to be mindful is that we can actually tolerate this world rather than be frightened of it. And it's not just a a personal um, freedom that comes, but as James Baldwin writes, I imagine one of the reasons that people cling to their hate and ignorance so stubbornly is because they sense that once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with their own pain. And so when we can't bear our pain or our fear or insecurity, we project it out on others, on the communists, you know, or on the black people or the yellow people or the native people or the Muslims or the immigrants or the, you know, um, was Russia for a while. I think Russia's coming back as the enemy du jour. It's going to kind of have a recurrence now. But we project it out because we live in a way that we can't bear the reality of insecurity. And yet, it's the truth of the world. So we learn more and more what it's like to be present for our body. And in the same way, we learn how to be present for our feelings, the tears and joy and grief and all the things that will come up on retreat. Um, And uh, this is a story from Frank Ostaseski, who started from Zen Center Hospice, a good friend of teaching with him recently. And he writes about Jillian, a woman she worked in publishing. And um, uh, her mother got Alzheimer's, and she said, decided to bring her mother with dementia to live with her and got a caregiver. She came home one day, walked in the living room to find all her beloved books, including her favorite Buddhist text, scattered across the floor. And her mother announced, I'm tired of all these dusty books. I'm going to give them to my dentist. All right. And you sort of hear the mind state. 
And she became immediately angry and trapped and caught up and started to scold the caregiver. How could you let this happen? How could you let her do this? And the caregiver, who wasn't caught in that drama, replied, Madam, today I pack the books up. Tomorrow I will unpack them. If this gives a sense of control to a woman who has lost so much, well then, that's okay with me. It doesn't matter so much. I just like being with her. And you can feel the graciousness of heart and the ability to be with uncertainty and change that's in that story. And this is why we call it loving awareness. We start to learn a graciousness with the body experience, with the feelings that we have, um, with the mind states that come. Because we'll have all kinds of views come here. You're doing well, your mind tells you. You're not doing well. The world is a mess, yeah, but it's so beautiful, you know, and everything in between because it has no pride and it just keeps spit, spitting out stories and plans and wise things and fearful ones and beliefs and so forth. When I was eight or nine years old, yeah, probably around nine, we lived in Buffalo, New York, lots of snow, and there was this huge snowstorm, icy winds. And my twin brother and I, my other brother, a year younger, we decided, we went out to play and it got all wrapped up. Wind was blowing wildly. And my twin brother was a lot bigger than I. I you know, he played football and I was not a football player, we'll just say that. Um, uh, much more robust. And so I was really skinny then and I was shaking and shivering. And it was freezing cold and I'm shaking out there. And he looked at me and said, it's not cold. I said, what do you mean? He said, he took off his hat, he wrapped, unwrapped his scarf. It's not cold, the wind is blowing, freezing. Took off his jacket. Pretty soon he stripped himself down to the waist and started dancing around saying, you just think it's cold. You just think it's cold. And I remember this for my whole life. There was something about him, even as a young boy, knowing that mind states determine how we live in this world and I didn't have to be caught and oh it's terrifying and it's cold and I'm frightened and I'm shivering and I have to go inside. Um, so as we become aware of the content of experience and can see the stories we tell and the beliefs we go oh that's a belief that's a story how interesting but we don't have to get caught in it. Now the next level of mindfulness is mindfulness of the process. And you, especially who've been practicing for some time over these months and years, as you quiet your mind and open your heart, the sense of freedom of being able to be with experience begins to shift because you start to look at the process of body and mind and senses in the world. And what you see is that it's all impermanent. It's all arising and changing and passing away and selfless in the sense that you don't choose your thoughts. I hope not, anyway. Most of them in there you wouldn't choose. Um, you don't choose your feelings very much. Um, you certainly don't choose your body sensations. And you see that it's ephemeral, insecure, subject to change, subject to pain. This is the way it is. And that everything you pay attention to arises for time and vanishes. All of it. In the time you listen to this one sentence, 50,000 cells will have been born in your body and 50,000 will have died. So that's a billion in a day. Your body's always dying and being reborn and remaking itself, as is your whole idea of yourself. And as you start to see the process of experience, then a different kind of freedom comes because you can realize it's all changing and you don't want to hold on to it. Otherwise you get rope burn. The, I remember walking with Ajahn Chah one day out on a alms round and there was a big boulder in the field nearby and he said to us, is that boulder heavy? And of course, we said to the master, yes, it is. And he said, not if you don't pick it up, <laughs> you know. And that was kind of a pith teaching of um, seeing the process of life and realizing that we 
can tend to it. We can respond, we can care for our family, our community, and the world, but we don't have to grasp it because it's ungraspable. And there grows an ease with birth and death and joy and sorrow. So the second level of freedom comes when we start to see the nature of things. Um, And we get easy with it. Again, Frank uh, Soseski tells a talk about a woman who died at San Hospice. And one of her sons, her son was uh, 12 years old, Down syndrome. And they were afraid to bring him Tommy Um, because they didn't know how he would understand his mother's death. But Frank said, you know, let's try it out. And then the father said, well, maybe we should talk to his therapist. And Frank said, bring the therapist along. We'll kind of, we'll work it out. So anyway, Tommy went in to see his mother and stood there for a bit. Everybody was frightened that he'd freak out. And he looked at her and he said, "Um, what is gone? Just kind of in wonder. What is gone? And then he looked at his mother for a while and Frank said, what do you think, Tommy? And he started to talk about the Transformers movies where one thing would transform to another and she died, maybe she'll turn into something else. Very wise. And he said he stood there with him, realizing that he was trying to understand in his own way. And then he did a kind of remarkable thing. Frank said, is there anything else you want to say to your mother? or do with your mother? And he said, Tommy went over, first he touched her very gently on her cheek, and then he began to smell her. And he sniffed her whole body from head all the way down to her feet. And Frank said he remembered one time he was driving in New England and a car ahead of him had hit a deer, killed it, and there was a fawn with this mother. And there was the there was the deer that had died, the mom on the side of the road, and there was the fawn coming and sniffing its mother, trying to understand what happened. And he said he stood there and it was it was so tender and so mysterious to have him just go and be there and smell his mother. And then he said, yes, okay. And then he walked out. I mean, this is us. We're in this mystery of birth and death. And to know the process of things gives a profound sense of freedom that it is natural to be born, it's natural to die, it's natural to have birth and death and joy and sorrow and praise and blame and gain and loss and there grows a graciousness and an understanding. And then the third level of mindfulness that happens is the mindfulness of consciousness itself. Content process consciousness. So that when my teacher Ajahn Chah, who had practiced as a monk in the forest for about 10 years, very ardently, you know, in in those days the forest had tigers and everybody got malaria pretty much and it was, and he did all these austere practices and lots of deep meditation and had visions and profound insights and so forth. He finally went to see the greatest master of that time, another Ajahn named Ajahn Man, told him all about his practices and said, do you have any guidance for me? And Ajahn Man looked back at him and says, yes, Cha, you've missed the point. He said, those are just experiences. Dissolve your body into light, have a great vision, have some deep insight, overcome pain and pleasure and so forth. Those are like movies. You get a war movie and a documentary and a romantic comedy, a love story. They all come and go. The only question for you to ask for your freedom is to whom do these happen? So turn your attention from the content or even the process of the experience back to the knowing and become the one who knows. And this invites a shift of identity. You live in illusion and the appearance of things, says Kalu Rinpoche, a great old Tibetan Lama. There is a reality, but you do not know this. When you remember, you will discover that you are nothing. 
and being nothing, you are everything. That is all. So there's something for you to reflect on for the next nine days. Um, What it's pointing to is this. Let me see if I can say it much more simply. Because this is this is really a key to liberation. When you look in the mirror, you notice you've aged, right? We all have that experience, okay. Losing its fur and sagging and doing the things that aging happens, wrinkling and all those things. But the weird thing that's very common is you don't necessarily feel older. You know how common that experience is. And that's because it's only your body that's aged. And your body exists in time. It grows and a little child and a, you know, a, 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 an older child and a teen and a young adult and it goes on and then it gets older and it dies. But the awareness that's looking at that body in the mirrors doesn't exist in time. And it says, oh, well, how are we doing at this stage of life? Hmm, lost some more fur, you know, or whatever your commentary on it is. I wonder how much longer this one will last. This because, you, you know, you get it from Avis and then you have to turn it back in or something like that, right? It's just how it works. So you start to look into the mystery of who are you and you turn your attention back to become the awareness itself, to become, to look into who, who are you and to become the knowing, the one who knows. And you know this already in your cells. You know this in your being. We know this. Alice Walker writes... One day I was sitting there like a motherless child, which I was, and it came to me, that feeling a part of being, feeling of being a part of everything. And I knew if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laughed and I cried and I run all around the house. When it happens, you just can't miss it. And walking in the high mountains, listening to a piece of sacred music, making love, sitting there with someone who's dying, or being there at the birth of a new human being. It's a really wild thing. Here's another person, you know, coming out of someone's body. It's wild. And you go, okay, all right. Um, I don't really have the kind of intellectual answer, but I'm present for this mystery of life itself coming coming out of nothing. And you start to become the witness. You start to trust that you be that you can rest in awareness itself. Um, And this level of mindfulness gives you, as Ajahn Man said, this is the level that gives you the greatest freedom of all, the freedom to sit with birth and to sit with death. And when you have this freedom, then I think of my good friend and colleague and teacher, Mahagosananda, who was the Gandhi of Cambodia and nominated for the Nobel Prize many times and told these stories so often, but he went back after the Cambodian genocide and uh, the Khmer Rouge and spent 15 years leading people back to their villages on foot saying you can't go in a bus or a car, you have to reclaim your land step by step with chants of loving kindness. Hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. And um, walking through the jungles and the killing fields, ringing a bell and chanting all the way back. And he was somebody who had had this this very deep training. And he knew 19, all 19 members of his family had been killed. There was a way in which he knew how to return to the world because the end of this process of content or or this, this mindfulness from content to process to consciousness itself doesn't end in some kind of spaced out realm, uh, but rather when you enter and discover that who you are is nothing and being nothing, you are everything, as Kala Rinpoche said, then the world is your family. Then you return um, and you enter the world with a wiser heart and with a freer spirit, no matter what happens. Now, as you continue to practice on this retreat, you will sense these levels as you go through what are the foundations of mindfulness. As your body opens up more, and Christiana is going to talk more about it um, tomorrow evening, um, 
you can learn how to be present for your body, not by striving, but as Spring talked about, with a graciousness or an ease. And you let your body settle, you know, or if you can't, and if you can't be with your breath, you can pay attention to your hands or to the sound that's around you. But you keep gently coming back and steadying your attention. And as you do, of course, in the content level, you become able to be aware of the different pains and tension and the things that are carried in your body. Um, But at the same time, you also will start to find moments of ease and pleasure. And joy is one of the factors of enlightenment, peace and equanimity, other factors of enlightenment. And for those who are experienced practitioners, one of the best instructions you can have is to look for the moments of ease and the moments of joy and the moments of presence and invite them to expand. Let the sense of well-being that comes, starts to come periodically as you sit or you walk, um, invite them to open, dwell in them, rest in them. And you start to shift the figure ground from the struggle with the body, even though sometimes you have to sit with things that are quite difficult and painful. Instead, you also invite a sense of ease and peace and well-being. And this shift um, becomes really helpful. And then as your mind gets quieter and you shift from content to process, the experiences of the body and the senses begin to break up and pixelate. And every sensation that's tight in the body or the sounds you hear and so forth become like many little vibrations. Um, And whatever seems solid starts more and more to become visible to your mindfulness or your loving awareness as a kind of vibrating energy field that's full of life and not solid at all. And Trudy and I were at a conference together with uh, Alyssa Eppel, and she works with Liz Blackburn at UC Medical Center here. Liz got the Nobel Prize for um, discovering telomeres. And um, so part of their research, which completely shocked them, was that after eight weeks of meditation practice, the telomeres, which are the caps on the end of chromosomes that kind of protect them and keep them longer alive and so forth, actually grew and extended. And they couldn't believe it. They replicated a few times. They were afraid to publish it because people would think they were kind of kooky, but it hasn't been replicated. But that wasn't what she talked about. We kind of knew that. But she talked about some new research. And part of it, and I, I really want to read this study to figure out how they did it is that um, they studied the telomeres in a community that had a big disparity between rich and poor. And those who were poor, as you would expect, had frayed the telomeres and the stress and the poverty and the, you know, racism and all the kinds of suffering um, affects the body very deeply. But the thing that was interesting is that those who were wealthy in that community, even if they were in a gated community, their telomeres also had um, diminished. Um, It's as if the cells of your body are tuned in to the environment. You are not separate from your environment. It's really wild. So as you get deeper and quieter, you start to see the body as an energy field. Yes, you can be with the content, but you see the process of life itself. Um, And then there comes the mysterious thing that happens where you both love the body and tend it and care for it because it's really precious. And yet I think of this quadriplegic who came to some Dharma teachings, um, and I can still hear his voice at one point where he said, ah, I've discovered I am not the body. He'd been in, you know, he'd been unable to move for a number of years. He said, I've discovered I am not this body. Hallelujah, he shouted it out. And so there's both the care for the body But in this paradoxical way, there's also an understanding that you rent it, you use it, you love it, you care for it, but it's not who you really are. In the same way, these levels work with feelings. And you notice the content of your feelings. As C.S. Lewis wrote, you will discover inside 
a, a, a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, and a harem of fondled hatreds, you know, <laughs> and every other feeling in between. Um, you know, I won't read it, but I have a list of 500 different feelings. And so you start to see the content of the feelings, and you're able to be present for them, and to name them, acknowledge this is sadness, sad, sad, this is excitement, excitement, excitement. And by naming the experiences, like naming the dragon, there comes a kind of freedom in relationship to them. But then there comes, um, uh, well, as that goes on, there comes a kind of maturing because people often don't even know what they're feeling. And I have a friend named Arturo Bihar, who was the vice president of Facebook for a while. Um, and his job, among other things, he was an engineer, but then he was in charge of problem solving for Facebook. And he said, so I was also the complaints department. And because we have 980 million users, it didn't take very long to get a million complaints. <laughs> Talk about complaints department. So he said about a third of them were engineering problems. I gave them to the engineers and they fixed them. That's what engineers do, mostly if they're good. But two thirds of them were the problems between people. You posted a picture of me that I don't like. I don't look good in it. And you posted a picture of my children. How dare you? And you said that. And so it was conflict between people. And at first, he sent the boilerplate um, policy. If it's lewd or lascivious or hateful or whatever, then we will take it down. This is our policy. Nobody was happy. So then he realized we have to do something about these complaints. And he thought maybe it would be good if they contacted each other. So he started sending out a message, why don't you talk to the person that upset you? Or message them, whatever. Um, but then he realized people weren't very skillful at that. So he said, why don't you tell them what upset you and how you felt about it? Well, after a little while, he found that the people didn't know what they felt. So he sent all out those little emoticons, angry, sad, whatever, okay. You can show them how you felt about it. And then he said, and why don't you get curious and ask them why they posted it? And then the people who answered would say, well, I thought you looked good in that picture, you know, or I love your children. I thought it was a great thing. I'm so sorry. And it turned out that in 95% of the cases or something like that of people who talk to each other, the conflict was resolved. And as Arturo said, I get to teach social and emotional learning and conflict resolution skills to 980 million people, you know. <laughs> but this is something that we're learning in a much deeper way in ourselves, to recognize what we're feeling. And often that means recognizing the trauma, the deep hurts that are carried in our body, the stories that come with it, the, the emotions. Um, and being willing and able to be present for it all, um, the content of it. And then something very interesting happens because you feel both the suffering you've been through and the beauty of your life. You kind of open yourself to that and you become able to bear your measure of tears and your measure of sorrows. And then as the heart becomes more tender, as you've practiced and many of you have for a long time, you actually become more sensitive, but you also become more courageous and wiser. And you're able to tolerate both the tears and the joy of the world to bear, to witness to them, to bear them. And then you get something called the tears of the way, which are tears that are kind of poignant. Um, you feel the sufferings of the world and you see its unbearable beauty and they, you let your heart be touched by them all. And the fact that we don't know this in our culture, you know, as someone said, that I'd like to take every mother in hand and walk them next to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and have them read out loud the names of everyone who was lost before anybody votes for war. You know, do not send a man to war who does not know how to weep. And so when we talk about in our body politic, the kind of conflicts that that are happening and have happened, if that person isn't weeping, they're not paying attention. 
So we become more sensitive, but we also increase our capacity for love, for presence. And as we do, we start to see the river of feelings that make up human life. Fear and longing and love and grief and loss and delight and, you know, the feelings of connection and creativity. And we can bow and name them. Fear is like this. Longing is like this. Love is like this. Sadness is like this. Um, Connection is like this. And we start to inhabit or feel this is the nature of human incarnation. And we see the process of life itself rather than taking it so personally. And then we look at the mind, the third foundation of mindfulness, and the thoughts. And this, of course, becomes really important as those of you who practice for a long time and have matured, because we're really talking about how we live and embody this as well as on retreat. And the Buddhist text, it says, who is your enemy? Mind is your enemy. No one can harm you worse than your own mind untrained. Who is your friend? Mind is your friend. No one can help you more than a trained and tame mind, not even the most loving parents or loving members of your family. And so you start to see the stories and the attitudes, you get the content of it, um, and the whole inner dialogue, you know, that you build your sense of self and world out of. And it's kind of sometimes rather alarming for those who come on their first retreat. It's like you're stuck in Motel 6 late at night and the shopping channel's on and you can't turn it off. And you get all this. And you start to realize that 95% of what's in there is reruns. You know, they're the same bad show as from yesterday or good show or whatever. They keep repeating themselves. The mind secretes thoughts like the salivary gland secretes saliva. It just does. But you also begin to notice the attitudes that you glom onto or that you get attached to, this is right and this is wrong and so forth, you start to see those different thoughts and attitudes. And then, because you've been practicing for a while, you get to do what my beloved Trudy has taught me about, which she calls an attitude adjustment. (laughs) Where you see, okay, this is an attitude, but it actually doesn't have my best interest in mind. And you actually begin to realize that you can shift from one particular view or attitude to another. Um, And so you start to know the content and the stories and you don't believe them so much. You don't take them so seriously. The stories of unworthiness or the stories of grandiosity, you know, the stories of success or failure, you know what your mind does, all of those kinds of things. And there comes a shift of identity where you're not so much identified with your thoughts. This becomes more the process. And so there's that wonderful story that I like to tell of Ram Das, you know, coming back from India with his beard and beads and so forth, as Baba Ram Das teaching, and the woman in the front row waving her hands and saying, well, Ram Das, you're teaching all these Hindu things, you can do guru, but aren't you Jewish? And Ram Das said, yeah, I am actually. He says, yeah, I was bar mitzvahed, as I was bar mitzvahed and Jewish. And Ramda says, and I, there's a lot I love about Judea, Judaism. He said, the Hasidic masters are like the Zen masters. If you read Uber's tales of the Hasidim, they're fantastic. And the Kabbalah has all these maps of the levels of consciousness that are a, a great match to all the great Hindu teachings I like and so forth. He, wanted, he said, but remember, I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. <laughs> you know? And he was, of course, very witty as well well as deep Um, because your identity is not your parents and it's not even your gender or your race you know or your class those are things to honor and pay attention to and without it we can have a lot of suffering but that's not fundamentally who you are and as you become quieter you start to see oh that's only the personality when you look at the thoughts in the mind like your pet okay You've got it, unfortunately, you you know, you've got a mutt in some cases, one of those adopted from the shelter. Um, But you start to realize that the thought structures and the beliefs and the things you've been told about yourself, 
not only can you adjust your attitude, but you can also step back from them and see them. Those are just thoughts coming and going. They're like bubbles in a stream and they don't last. And it doesn't take that much. Um, Here's a letter I got. Dear Jack, I really don't know how to talk to you directly, but I wanted to express how grateful I am just to be aware of your teachings. I found out about you through Duncan Trussell's podcast last year, who's a kind of Dharma comedian, whatever, has a big following among millennials. Um, and uh, I did some things with him. He said, and little by little, your ideas of loving yourself and having compassion kept inching their way toward what I guess is my heart. You soothed me in darker days and given me a glimpse into a more loving reality for myself. Tonight, I finally gave in and tried meditating. I decided after hearing you speak through my phone for months and months, I'd finally give in and just sit with myself for a while. I'm not sure I've ever cried tears of joy like that in the 21 years I've lived so far. For the first time, I stopped and really held my anger that I've latched on to my anxiety, my hatred, and everything else I criticize myself about with softness and compassion, without judgment. And all of a sudden, I felt like I really could be loving to myself in the same way that I want to love others. I finally got some relief with what I felt inside and want you to know that I love you for it. Thank you so much. It doesn't take that long. You don't have to go to the Himalayas. Maybe you have to come to Spirit Rock, but that's another story. And so you start to see these layers of mindfulness that acknowledges the content, that sees the process, and then steps back. um, And the shift of identity, as Thomas Merton says, there is in all things, Thomas Merton, the Christian mystic, there is in all things an inexhaustible, an inexhaustible sweetness and purity a silence that is a fount of action and joy. It rises up in wordless gentleness and flows out to me from unseen roots of all creation, welcoming me tenderly, saluting me with humility and humanity. And he's talking about his meditation, that that all these things come unbidden, the joys and sorrows, but underneath as we shift our identity and become the one who knows, there comes a spaciousness and a freedom and a beauty. And that's the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which is mindfulness of the Dharma, of the laws that are operating. For example, the law um, of cause and effect. That if you practice anger, guess what becomes more your habit? Anger. And not only that, if you plant seeds of anger by getting angry at lots of other people, guess what you will get back? Anger. If you plant seeds of love and practice love in yourself, that's what will grow. And you plant it in the world, that's what will return. If you plant greed in yourself, you know, that's what will grow in you. And so you start to see this is, it's very impersonal actually. This is simply how consciousness works. And then you begin to see the emptiness of it. As it says in the Dhammapada and the Diamond Sutra, like a star at dawn, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo, a rainbow, a phantom, a dream. Things arise, thoughts, feelings, experiences, whole years. I mean, what happened to 2016? It's back there with Y2K, remember that one in the year 2000? And also back there with, uh, I don't know, you know, the Great Depression and the Egyptian um, empires and dynasties and so forth. All in the past, it went back to emptiness. There's this, and then it disappears. And as you get quiet, you start to see, whoa, wait a second, it seems very solid, but all there is, is now. All there is, is this present. And you become more and more than able to rest in the awareness of this, you become the one who knows. There's a shift in reality for you that the experiences of the world, they still arise, 
but there's a sense of spaciousness, openness, graciousness, and of deep love. As my teacher Nisargadon in Bombay, the old guru, said, wisdom sees that I am nothing, and love sees that I am everything, and between these two my life flows. Because as you get more empty, and if you look to see who am I, who am I the little awareness inside here, like that's yourself, you look and you can't find anything except it's aware. There's no self, nothing separate, and you start to realize that awareness is what the world is made of, consciousness itself. All things born out of consciousness. And from this place, you realize that it's your family then. This is who you are. Wisdom says I am nothing. Love says I am everything. Between these two, my life flows. Mother Teresa puts it one way. She says, the trouble with you is you draw your family circle too small. Life is your family. You come out of life, you are life, and you are what life is born from. I think of Sharon Salzberg, our dear friend, colleague, who was walking down the street one day in Seattle when a somewhat toothless homeless man came up to her, you know, and said, don't you know me? Don't you know me? And first she had to stop because we've had a lot of students on retreats. And I was that in my 1978 three-month retreat or whatever it could have been. But it turned out it wasn't somebody she literally knew. But she said the moment was so affecting to her when he said, don't you know me? Because he's one of us. He's one of us. He's one of our family members. And as you get emptier, or as you learn to rest as awareness itself, you discover that this is what's real, this and love. Because in the end, the point isn't to perfect yourself, it's to perfect your love. To be able to open the heart and mind and realize that as the texts say, O nobly born, remember who you really are. Remember your true nature. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. Everything is waiting for you. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything is waiting for you. This is David White. I feel so grateful to have had the years of practice and training where I've learned some of these things I speak about in myself. Um, Sometimes I don't really know how people even can get through great difficulties without having some some inner practices. It's so much harder. Um, And I also just feel grateful that we have a community together to remind one another. It's, it's welcoming. And uh, revolutionary. Who you really are. There's a freedom and an invitation. And the beautiful thing that the Buddha says when he speaks about freedom is If it were not possible to free the heart and mind amidst all the changing circumstances of the world, I would not teach you to do so. But just because it is possible and possible for you, I offer these teachings. You are sitting at the bedside of the world, the world of birth and death, joy and sorrow, and you're learning how to do it beautifully. So thank you. Mm